University is supposed to prepare students for the world beyond the classroom. But for some people, that includes the battle they have to fight with the university itself to get appropriate recognition and accommodation for their disabilities. Joining us now to explore that and look at what awaits those grads in the world of work, Brad Seward, doctoral candidate at the University of Guelph, and Rock Longape, founder of Accessible Nation, an advocacy group for people with disabilities. Welcome to the both of you. Hello. How are you? Oh, great. I like the blue. We Thank all you. kind of match. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brad, we're going to get into the report sure. in a little bit, but I wanted to know, why did you want to learn more about post-secondary grads with disabilities? Well, uh, youth with disabilities is a uh, increasingly educated and underrepresented group in the sociolo sociology of education. Um, there's lots of research that's been done on adults with disability, but much less has been said about post-secondary graduates. Uh, post-secondary graduates are in a particularly vulnerable position, uh, specifically the er their early labor market outcomes. Why? Uh, what we find is, is that the first few years after, after leaving university is uh, when students struggle the most. Uh, they're paying back student loans, they're trying to navigate early labor, uh, early careers. Mm -hmm. They're trying to establish families. There are, there are many things that sort of come all at once once that transition is made into the labor market. And seeing how persons with disabilities navigates these transitions is particularly important. It's also been uh, understudied in, in the sociology of education. Uh, there's actually very few quantitative studies that have looked at, at Canadian represented data. Why do you think that is? Part of the problem is that mm -hmm. Uh, the National Graduate Survey data is one of our greatest surveys uh, for studying this. The unfortunate part is that it uh, aggregates disability, so it doesn't allow for a lot of in-depth study of, of disability. Mm -hmm. However, it does allow us to create these uh, exploratory studies to view uh, the outcomes of individuals as a whole. How would you define disability? Uh, disability in the, in the NGS is looked at um, with, through the question of whether or not a respondent has had a disability or impairment that's lasted at least six months. So it aggregates uh, many different forms of disability and allows us to, to look at this from a broad spectrum. Um, it, from physical to absolutely, mental? Absolutely. There's labor, um, sorry, there's learning disabilities, mm -hmm. emotional and behavioral disabilities, physical disabilities, and then as well as others. So it's a self-disclosure, um, a self-disclosed question. Mm -hmm. So we capture just about the full spectrum of disability, which is a really big strength for our study. And how did you compile the data? Uh, the data is uh, a, a provincial or sorry, a national representative study of all provinces and territories looking at all graduates uh, from 2005 surveyed in 2007. There are approximately 31,000 post-secondary graduates, mm -hmm. 1,600 of which uh, were persons with disabilities. To, uh, if it's from 2005, how can you trust the data? Because it's 11 years ago. Right. Um, the NGS okay. is actually uh, a really valuable uh, survey to use. Mm -hmm. um, it, especially the 2005 survey has a lot of strengths because they changed the survey uh, most recently. The 2013 survey has gone to a three-year um, uh, survey cycle. Mm -hmm. So the 2005 allows us to compare to previous uh, survey years before it. It's also... Um, uh, highly representative in that the 2005 survey actually was released around 2009 2010 so it's still quite recent uh, there are surveys or uh, research reports now coming out that still utilize that survey and, and who did you write the report for uh, we wrote it for the government of, uh, of uh, Canada sorry we, we wrote it for uh, SHRC it's a social mm -hmm. sciences and human resources council of Canada mm -hmm. it's a government funded um, uh, council and I wrote it with professors David uh, Zarifa at Nipissing University and David Walters at the University of Guelph. Rock, I want to bring you into the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I And to, uh, to before just, we, we talk, sure. though, uh, usually on the summer, not to interrupt you, um, usually on the summer set, we don't have this, the mm -hmm. desk, the big desk. I mean, I like it. I get to mm -hmm. do this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, you wanted the desk. Why? Um, well, I'm, I'm a person that has, I have uh, complex PTSD. I have moderate traumatic brain injury, just diagnosed just a year ago, uh, 30 years post-injury. Um, and so because I come from a path, the, the reason I have those disabilities is a result of injuries from a childhood trauma. Uh, and in trauma, you have all kinds of triggers. Um, and if your body, like mine is, uh, your brain is compromised, your ability to respond to those things in a very rational way becomes more compromised. So 
the issue for me is, you know, for me, it's it's a personal boundary thing that I, I don't like having people too close in my physical space. Mm -hmm. um, that's a trigger for me because of the the the, what the trauma I experienced was very violent, uh, and the result was serious uh, physical trauma. So ultimately, I'm I'm it's my bound my personal boundary of, of making sure that I'm not in a place where I'm being triggered in any way that's going to send me off into a state of depression or anxiety. Well, so. I'm glad you're here, yeah. and uh, we want to do everything that we can make yeah, to make you that. feel comfortable. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted you to respond to what Brad said about the I, I wanted to, actually, just to, if I can ask a question here at this point. Mm -hmm. um, when was the census, Canada's census, dropped off or cancelled? Because the former government, the federal government, cancelled mm -hmm. that. And, and I think that would have impacted uh, the results of your study somewhat, would it not have? Or? Well, actually, uh, cuts to surveys was a significant issue for us because the 2005 was supposed to have a follow-up in 2010. Right. So it would allow us to see uh, the outcomes two years and then uh, again three years after graduation, which would have been um, really beneficial in order to be able to see how those, those outcomes become projected over time. Uh, so cuts to the surveys have been particularly uh, damaging in, in some respects. I wanted to get you both to look over my shoulder at the monitor over there. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you a clip, and this is Steve Pakin into, uh, talking with David Lepofsky, yep. chair of the Toronto District School Board Special Education Advisory Committee, about how students with disabilities are treated. The problem is that our school system has been designed for decades on a false and unfair premise. Back in the 70s and afterwards, it was based on the idea that the main, there are two kinds of students. Normal students, they don't use that word anymore, but they did for years, and then exceptional students. Normal students uh, are the ones for which schools are built, teachers are trained, curriculum are designed, gym equipment is bought, and so on. Everybody else is an exceptional student. If you can't benefit from the a system of education that wasn't designed for you, if you have a disability so that you can't get in the school or can't read the books uh, or, or don't learn the way uh, uh, others uh, do, then you're considered an exception. Rock, I want to ask you first, how accurate is his characterization of students with disabilities? Well, I, I think that he's right, but what he's in a way talking about is the lack of definition about disabilities. And I know that we were kind of touching on that a little bit, and, and Brad may have touched a little bit on that in his report, but mm -hmm. uh, there isn't a clear definition of that. Um, and part of it is we're expecting that to come from a system that has been prejudiced for, for you know, centuries as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, and it's driven by an economic force uh, that's been present in, in uh, our systems of governments uh, and governance and, and uh, private sector systems for, for centuries. That's part of the problem. Uh, we've got to be able to get past that, um, that prejudice, and I, I don't think we're anywhere close to that, but he's absolutely right. The disparity for, uh, for disabled people in this province alone is huge. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a study done by the Human Rights Commission about a decade ago that talked about that uh, every uh, educational institution on every level in this province did not understand their obligations, clear obligations to students with disabilities for accommodations, period. And, and they're absolutely accurate, and that's still a problem today. So he's absolutely right. I think he's accurate, yeah. And Brad? Um, I think there's something to be said about uh, the rhetoric that was used, the idea of normal versus special. And I think uh, recently, at least in the wider literature, we've seen a move from deficit-based teaching or pedagogical strategies to strength-based pedagog pedagogical strategies. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, that's been a, a a helpful move in that the strength-based approaches really emphasize uh, self-advocacy, uh, the ability to negotiate in conversations, uh, self-image, self-determination, all of those things have moved away from this idea of a deficit to, to a strength. There's been some literature that's talked about how purely special education doesn't necessarily translate well to the labor market um, once, once there's integration. Mm -hmm. So that idea of a strength-based approach provides an individual with the self-determination and self-image that allows them to make a successful transition. I, I would just add, if I can, and I, I respectfully, Brad, I, I, a lot of respect for you and, and the work you've done so far. I respectfully disagree because uh, I, I think uh, we are only at an, an aesthetics. There's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. We are, it's simply like a, a bunch of worshipers going into a church hall and they mouth their you know, lips in motion to what's being said, but the minute they leave the worship service, 
it's fair game again. They're back to their old ways. And and really, we are we've got we've certainly got instruments now legally and legislatively. But in terms of the implementation of that, it does not exist. The federal government has said what they want to do is they want to implement the UN Convention on the Rights of a Persons with Disabilities. They haven't even declared a plan yet at this point. But the point is, there are, in fact, that they're talking about implementing, mm -hmm. I think, speaks loudly uh, in disagreement to, to what Brad had to say, respectfully, Brad. Absolutely. But you know, that's but that's where. But as a person who lives with disabilities, mm -hmm. you know, anybody you talk to who has disabilities you'll hear them say that they encounter discrimination on a regular basis. I'm somebody with an invisible disability. Uh, somebody who has a visible disability, it's more obvious that they have a disability and need uh, accommodation. But mm -hmm. for people who have invisible disabilities, if we look or act in any way different, we're treated differently as well. I, so I think this whole, I think David Leposky is absolutely right about his perception or his, his uh, um, his, his take on that, I think he's, uh, he's in the right direction. But again, we're not anywhere near where we need to be. Mm -hmm. We have what a long way to go. What do you think needs to be done? Uh, I think we need a national uh, this dialogue on the issue of disabilities, which is why I'm, mm -hmm. I've, uh, uh, I've launched the Accessible Nation campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to push for a national strategy on disabilities so where we have the consumers and stakeholders all at the table talking and hammering out national priorities on what needs to be done with this issue and moving forward. Because again, part of the issue here is in, in coming years, we're looking at almost 80% of the population in this country who's gonna be suffering from chronic illnesses. That's an astounding are, number. Are we going to be ready as a country to face that? Australia right now mm -hmm. has already implemented a new plan to address that issue because they were facing the same problem. But in, in Canada here, we're nowhere near where we need to be. But we need to understand the issue better and there needs to be a national dialogue because people, need to, uh, the, the issue is that we look at, for example, here in, in Ontario, uh, the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, the majority of cases uh, before their, their courts uh, in the last 15 years, since they changed uh, the term handicapped to the term disability, has been disability claims, the majority. And so the question you have to ask is, why? Why is that a rally in a court, and a, which is a body that's supposed to enforce those laws mm -hmm. and to help achieve that sense of uh, civil order and balance? Well, you've had your own fight. Um, you've been trying to go to school, mm -hmm. like both secondary school. What's your experience been like trying to do that? Well, it's, it's interesting, and, and I've taken two universities uh, to court. One case has been settled, that with, with Wilfrid Laurier University, mm -hmm. and uh, the University of Waterloo is currently before the courts with us. Uh, that's still, uh, still in the process of court proceedings. But um, essentially what happened in that is I made an application, and they failed to accommodate me on that application. They didn't take an, an, into account, which I had provided medical documentation to support that I had disabilities mm -hmm. and, and why. Uh, they said that their standard was a C mark for you to get into, and this is just an undergraduate program, not a postgraduate program, because I had been in I was in university over a decade ago. My marks were a D. Uh, I didn't qualify, and so the challenge in the courts that we put before the university tribunal is we're questioning that standard, telling, saying simply, this is not a reasonable standard because. I'm somebody who has told you that I was diagnosed, a late diagnosis of complex PTSD mm -hmm. and uh, moderate traumatic brain injury, both injuries which are very serious and very serious disabilities, which require accommodation. So there's no way they could have gauged or measured what my abilities would have been at uh, 10 years ago at mm -hmm. the time when that happened. But now we know, so now I can actually get the accommodations that I need in place and have a real chance or a shot at, at uh, succeeding in university, but they still said no. So we're saying that's wrong, it's a violation of the code, and we're now before the courts. And personally, why is it important for you to go back to school, to go to university? I, the part of the reality in our world is that if you don't have a degree or diploma, uh, you don't get a job. You really don't. The, the unemployment rates for people like me, in this province alone, a study was done by the Ontario Brain Injury Association in 2012, and that report found 87% of people alone in my category, brain injury people, um, are unemployed. Mm -hmm. For deaf and hard of hearing, it nationally it's 80%. For the blind, uh, nationally, it's 90%. It's, those are huge numbers. If that was the mainstream population, we'd be talking about a national crisis. Right. So it's very concerning. And so the challenge is that if you don't have every job you go to, you apply to, they, the first thing they look for is a degree or diploma. If you don't have that, 
you don't even get your foot in the door. So I have to. It's no. It's necessity. It's right. necessary for you to. Go so I to have work. to. I I can choose to live in utter poverty the rest of my life, continue doing the work I do, or I can fight as I've always had to do mm -hmm. uh, to get there. And the other part of that is it's it's not just about me. It's about that whole group of people that it impacts. We received a couple of statements. Uh, the first one is from Legal Aid Ontario, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which is funding your legal proceedings. Yep. Um, I'd like to read that. Legal Aid Ontario is proud to offer test cases among the services it offers. Test cases are important cases that possibly set a precedent in law. One such recent test case involved Rock Longape, a plaintiff in an ongoing matter challenging the failure of two different universities to properly accommodate Mr. Longape's disability. This case is still continuing and we would not normally comment, except Mr. Longape has given us his permission and wanted to express his support of LAO's work. We believe that test cases can help advance and protect the rights of low-income Ontarians and, ultimately, improve access to justice. We also received a statement from Wilfred Laurier. Yep. The university has offered Mr. Rock Longape admission to Laurier beginning in September 2016. Mr. Longape has confirmed his acceptance of this offer. As we would with any student who requests academic accommodation, we have arranged for Mr. Longape to meet with a consultant from the university's Accessible Learning Center to develop an accommodation plan that meets the student's needs. Mr. Longape has access to these and other university services to support his success as a student, and we look forward to having him join the Laurier community. We have also asked the University of Waterloo for a statement we did not receive one at the time of this recording. We will update that on our website if we do. And that is accurate. Um, I've, I've, uh, we, we reached a settlement. They mm -hmm. were the more reasonable of the two. Uh, and, and congratulations on getting thank in. You. Thank you. So this is now I can walk with my head held high. Yeah. And it, it sends a message to others who are in my situation that, that this is possible, that they don't have to uh, sit back and do nothing. But most people who have disabilities, it's a daily challenge just to survive, but if they're attacked with a further battle, it's 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 very overwhelming for them, and most people don't don't even try. So, this is the first case now with uh, Waterloo. Now that Laurier is over, uh, of its kind in the country, it likens to Ed Roberts in the United States, who was denied application or uh, admission to university because of his disabilities. They didn't want to accommodate his needs either. Mm -hmm. uh, he fought and challenged it and won and became uh, internationally renowned for his advocacy work on disability rights, um, and and certainly. The focus of where I will go with my work will be in that direction as well. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the, the matter with Waterloo is very important because this is the first case of its kind in the country, potentially inter and with international implications. So. Well, we asked the University of Waterloo for a statement, mm -hmm. and we did not receive one this time. That's of fine. This they're, they're permitted to do that. And we'll update our website if we do. Uh, Brad, I wanted to ask you this question, but I also want to ask you to as well, Rock. Um, how are comfortable? How comfortable are students disclosing that they have a disability? <clears throat> Uh, well, unfortunately, our study wasn't able to tap into that. Uh, mm -hmm. We look at post-secondary graduates, so we find out what happens once they've graduated. But the literature does speak about that in the, um, in the wider work, uh, workforce. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, what uh, a number of scholars have found is that persons with disabilities are generally uncomfortable uh, disclosing their disability or left with a, a weighing of the cost and benefits, particularly uh, the invisible, invisible disabilities, the learning disability, the emotional and behavioral disabilities. Um, for fear of both stigmatization mm -hmm. and for overt discrimination. So there's often a, a weighing of the, op the, the cost and benefit of doing that. And, um, and Rock? Yeah, and, I, and, and I, his findings is accurate, but I think I would also add that, um, you know, as somebody with disabilities, um, it's even if you do self-disclose, there, there's, it's a bit of a pickle because if you self-disclose, then the risk of discrimination actually is much higher. Um, if you fail to disclose, then you don't get the accommodations you need and you may fail at whatever you're trying to, to achieve. Right. So it's it's a balance It's hard to achieve. Again, it comes back to that whole sense that we need to sensitize and educate our society about this issue, that being different should not be a bad thing, it should be a good thing. Mm -hmm. That And it adds to the diversity um, of our culture and skills and leadership. Uh, and there's a lot of leadership and good skill and talent. And I can tell you many of the people who are on ODSP and on, on, on welfare and disability sports want to work. 
but they're being denied that opportunity. And again, this is why I've taken the two universities to court, because that's part of the issue, not just for me, but what it represents for other people as well. It's kind of, um, you know, the reality is we are all different, that's but it's right. kind of, they, no one's admitting that people are different, so no solutions can be found, right? It shouldn't be, it shouldn't matter that I'm different than you. Mm -hmm. It should be celebrated that that's a good thing, that's a diversity. And yes, I'm going to engage, you're going to engage me a little bit different than I might engage somebody else, mm -hmm. but that shouldn't make any difference. I mean, when people make a stink about, for example, autistic children because they see all these behaviors, autistic children, for example, part of their brain can't regulate their emotions. So if something happens that their routine is broken, that's their comfort zone, then they become very upset and they don't have the ability to regulate that emotion so being, without being very upset and overreacting. Mm -hmm. um, in the same notion, it would be this being like me going to, but people making that kind of judgment would be like me going to a, a, a woods in the forest and a bear comes out and attacks me and I get mad at the bear. Well, it's a bear. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's, I expect a bear to behave like that. I expect mm -hmm. somebody with autism and I expect people people with driven engineers to act certain ways, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think uh, that should be a bad thing. It should be that we learn to, we, we need to engage how to, how to get along and, and learn to live with each other, not continue finding fault in our differences, but finding the good thing in our differences. And not to have a huge population, a huge, a huge percentage of the population ignored. That's right. Um, Brad, how many grads with disabilities find jobs after they finish school, well, compared to uh, people with without disabilities? Yeah, so our study dealt with probabilities. So what we found was is that graduates with disabilities were much less represented in full-time employment and much more represented in part-time and unemployment. And some of the effects were quite large. In fact, we found that graduates with disabilities had twice the likelihood mm -hmm. of being uh, unemployed than persons without disabilities. Yeah. And how much, uh, from how much money did they earn? Is, was there a difference? Uh, it was substantial, yeah. So what we found on average was that there was a, a, an income gap of about $4,000 a year. Uh, but these effects were actually quite larger when we looked at uh, field of study. Uh, the liberal arts and business grads actually earned on average $6,000 less, which is really important because theories of cumulative advantage mm -hmm. uh, would argue that those inequalities can become entrenched over time, which exacerbates those differences. This is only two years out of graduation. Once you look at a life course perspective, it, gets harder. Uh, it, can, yeah. it can get much harder. And what advantage does education provide for people with disabilities? I think we touched on it a little it's bit. It's huge, yeah. yeah. As Rock said, uh, the literature has talked about uh, persons with disabilities who don't pursue post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. And the, the numbers are, are poor. Like, it's, it's, not, it's not encouraging. Uh, the, the thing about our study is that these are the people in the best position to succeed. They've made it through elementary school, they've made it through the tracting and the various right. processes that That's allow right. for selection out of post-secondary education that occurs in high school. Mm -hmm. They've made it to post-secondary education and then navigated it and graduated. So these people have proven that they're qualified individual, individuals in our labour market mm -hmm. and yet the outcomes aren't equal. Uh, this is the people in the best situation, and we're still seeing these staggering results. So there's a significant issue here. And do you think that uh, people who are hiring are not hiring people with disabilities because of stigma? Unfortunately, our study can't tap into the, the whys mm -hmm. uh, as much as the overall picture of what's happening. But part of it is that graduates are more represented in the trades and colleges as well as the liberal arts, which have all been characterized as being less lucrative and more difficult to transition to the labor market within the general population as well. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there, these individuals are overrepresented in these fields is part of the issue. And Rock, I mean, you're going back to school in a few, in just in a little a bit. Months, yeah. How are you feeling about that? Excited. I mean, I'm looking forward to thesis papers and all the things I want to write on and I'm looking at the subjects I'm interested in and mm -hmm. following in that direction. So I haven't declared what my major is going to be. This is my first year back. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's exciting. I mean, the first time I get accommodation uh, and, and it's, it's going to be kind of an experience to see how that accommodation works out now with my academic study, which mm -hmm. I've never had before. So it's, it's a wonderful experience and I think as well, it's, it's a point where I get to stand with my head held high and say, you know, I, I've done this and others can do it too and, and this is this creates a new path for people so I'm excited about it yeah and when you first started this fight to try to get back into school did you think this would be the outcome I think we were pretty um, we figured it would take longer but uh, mm -hmm. I think we were I was pretty confident we would win um, 
and but that's my opinion. I'm entitled to that. Mm -hmm. And Laurier will be entitled to their own opinion about it, and that's fine. And I'm not here to be contentious with Laurier. The, it's been settled. It's over, mm -hmm. uh, and we're now moving forward with schooling. So it's going to be a matter of how they deliver those services now too. They they are bound to uh, to deliver the services if if uh, they if they if they do it if they do what they did to me in the, in my application originally to another student that will also mean that they can return to court that i can take them back to court for that and, and if i found that out i would but i don't suspect that's going to be the problem i'm hoping they've learned their lesson they've been doing some studies and research on about different models and how to approach disabilities and accommodation so i'm a little bit pleased i see some progress being made and brad what do you think this will do for other students who are trying to get into school like rock uh, i think part of it is that there needs to be um, more education about the types of degrees and what, what's to be expected as they come out. Mm -hmm. um, as well as there needs to be better programs within universities, as Rock touched yeah. on. There are currently a couple uh, available in Ontario. There's the summer transition programs that are available, which essentially uh, helps persons with disabilities as they enter uh, post-secondary education, sort of become accustomed with, with the way of life, uh, what are, what's available to them, the accommodations, and it, it has been shown to be really positive on that, that uh, experience. As well, I believe Ontario has an Ontario Learning Opportunities Fund, which established uh, something around 13 disab uh, disability um, offices around various campuses to assist uh, persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So there are slow movements uh, meant to accommodate and, and the research is, and as we continue this discourse, um, th these things are, are getting addressed slowly, although not nearly enough as the report shows. Well, Brad, thank you so much for educating us more on this topic and for being here. Thank you. And Rock, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. And it's you'll be an back honor. on the show tomorrow and we'll yeah. talk some more. Wonderful. All right. Looking forward. Thank you Great. both. Thanks. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.